there we go. Okay. So thanks everyone for being here today. I want to uh, go ahead and get started with just a quick introduction to AVSpec and um, the AAVSO's involvement in um, spectroscopy and how you can be involved in all that good stuff. Um, that'll only take a few minutes. And then after that, it'll be, if you have any questions about spectroscopy, um, I'll be happy to help answer them if I can. So um, let me just share my screen here. All right, so if you go to the AVSO homepage at avso.org um, and scroll down to submit and access data, that is your key to AVSpec, our spectroscopy database. Um, you can just click here on upload or download spectroscopy and that takes you to the AVSpec page. Um, the goal of AVSpec is to collect spectra of any kind of variable star. Um, if it's in a VSO VSX database and it has an AU ID, then you can submit a spectrum of it. So that's basically every variable star that's considered interesting to study by amateur astronomers is going to have an AU ID. Um, you can see a list of the recently submitted spectra on the recent page. Probably you'll be most interested in the search and submit pages. So, um, here you can just enter. Uh, hold on just one second. Paul, could you go ahead and mute your microphone? We have some interference coming in from your end, I think. Um, OK, so um, here you can search for interesting stars. Uh, the search bring up um, all the spectra in the database for that star. Um, here's one that's kind of cool, UV reggae, um, carbon star symbiotic. And yeah, you can view spectra here. So if you want to do any kind of studies involving spectra, you can download them um, for your chosen target using these download buttons. If you want to submit your own spectra, which I hope that all of you will consider doing um, if you have the capability, you can do that on the submit page. I've already created a um, equipment definition here, so I can select my spectrograph um, and then upload a spectrum and then hit submit. Um, if you haven't already done that, then here's where you should do it. It's the site and equipment link down at the bottom. And then it just lets you type in some information about your site and your equipment, very simple. Um, equipment's up here. And if you need help with any of this, you can get that at the help tab. And we have a manual um, down here called the AVSO guide to getting started in spectroscopy. If you're new to spectroscopy, particularly if you're using a slit spectrograph, there's some really great tutorials in this document. So I would recommend checking it out. And I think that about covers it um, in terms of what the AVSO has available for spectroscopy. Um, oh, we also do have a forum, which you're welcome to post on. Chances are, if you're here, you know about the forum because <laughs> um, you probably came from there. So that's my overview. Now I want to go ahead and open things up to questions and discussion. Does anyone here have any questions about AV spec or spectroscopy in general? Can you hear me? Yes, Matthias? Yes. OK. Um, yeah, thanks, first of all. I think I looked into this database quite some some months ago, mm -hmm. one time or, or already, but I haven't. I'm, I have used a lot in the past this uh, French database. I'm not sure whether you know that uh, from uh, from all these good spectroscopy people in France, right? Mm -hmm. So I think they have a lot of uh, interesting spectra and I evaluated quite a lot of those spectra and also published a bit in the, in the German spectroscopy journal. Um, so I'm curious to see what, what kind of information is in, in this database. Yeah, maybe I can mm -hmm. also use that a lot. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, um, I think I know the group you're talking about, Spectro-ARAS, mm. A-R-A-S. Yes. Right, yeah. right, exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. 
they have a specific Nova section. That's very interesting. So you can oh, find cool. a hell out of spectra from Nova. I think from the from the recurrent Nova RS, RS of UG, which was last year, right? They have a, mm -hmm. I don't know, several hundred spectra also. Yeah. This very is, cool. This is, this is really a great database. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've seen some of some of their spectra, and they are fantastic quality. Mm -hmm. Really, the way that I see um, the Spectro Eras database and then the AVSpec database, I see mm -hmm. them as being kind of complementary, mm -hmm. um, almost like with our photometry um, database and our alert campaigns. The alert campaigns are very focused on getting high quality data of very specific targets of scientific interest. I see something kind of like that in ERAS, where they're they're doing these very focused campaigns that are re getting really impressive results, and then we have the AID for photometry, which accepts submissions on any kind of variable star. It's less focused, but more coverage of different types of stars, and that's how I see at least AV spec being because we accept uh, spectra from just about anyone on of just about anything as long as it's under the general class of variable stars. So, um, and we're trying to also use it as a bit of an education tool to help people learn how to become um, better observers with their, and how to use their spectrographs better. So yeah, anyway, um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you know about the Spectro ARAS site because that one is a really useful resource. So, okay, let's, let's, let's jump from a, a, a very general question there to a very specific question. Sure. I have a um, Starlight Instruments um, spectrograph. Mm -hmm. um, and with my camera, which is a ZWO ASI 294mm, um, I can see at a, a given exposure, 4,000 angstroms of range. And when trying to calibrate against miles targets, which is the database I've been using for calibration stars, mm -hmm. um, I can see further into red than any mile spectrum has. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, what does somebody recommend that I calibrate to out where miles don't exist or not available? That's a really good question. Because um, I can see out to 8,700 um, with the way I have it set up. So I can see 4,000 at a time. So 47 to 87. I'm interested in the calcium lines for the stars I'm looking at. And so that's why I go out there. Um, but anybody have any suggestions? Extinction, so, extinction is not that great out there. So mm -hmm. my, my suggestion would probably be to use the telluric bands as your calibration reference, um, especially because, you know, that won't be affected by redshift or blue shift if you happen to be shooting one of those extreme it, it's, targets. It, I, it's not wavelength calibration. I have, I have a set of um, neon argon lamps for wavelength calibration. I'm okay. talking about magnitude. For and instrument instru response. Instru instrument response calibration is my is my issue. Okay. Sorry, I misunderstood. Okay. No problem. Um yeah, I unfortunately I don't know of a good resource for um calibration that far out. I mean instrument response calibration. This this time of year I can use Vega, but because the spectrum from Vega is known from DC to light, but um I don't have that same capability at other times of the year. So I was just wondering if, if anybody else has the same issue or what they're doing or. So I, I do have some thoughts, but before I, I uh, say those, I do wanna give everyone else here a chance in case any of you have, have thoughts on this as well or experience with instrument response correction on the far right end. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone unmute themselves. So nobody goes out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame because that's one of the coolest regions of the spectrum, that calcium triplet. Okay. Um, well, those in passion lines are, I mean, um, mm -hmm. both right there. So 
Why not? Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I, I imagine for a lot of people, um, second order contamination may be part of the reason why not actually. Mm -hmm. um, but okay, so in terms of um, what I've used in the past to do incident response correction out that far, um, I realized that I, I have done that. Now I'm working in a what sounds like a, a different kind of resolution regime from you, although you can you can correct me. Um, I've been using a, a star analyzer optimized yeah. for resolution, but still only about R500, 600, something like that. Okay. Um, and in, so there's a library that comes preloaded with the RSpec software, but it's, it's freely available on the ESA Hubble site, um, the pickles reference library. Okay. And so that's the one that I've been using. Um, it does sound like there's a, a difference between the way that I do instant response correction and the way that you do it, which is that um, the way, at least that I, I learned to do it, you could take um, a spectrum of any star that is a known uh, static spectral type. So in this case, A05, it doesn't have to be precisely Vega with a reference spectrum of precisely Vega. It can be any A05 reference spectrum and any A05 um, spectrum that you observe um, because they're assumed to be similar enough. There's not, there's not too much interstar variation among the A05 stars. So you can uh, use, there's, there's a set of um, target lists out there for standard A05 stars around the sky. Um, and you can shoot those when Vega isn't up um, and still do the same instrument response correction procedure. So um, that's, that's an option that- Good, good put, good put. So the, it would be nicer to have something with a little bit more red in it because A zeros are kind of dim at 8,700 angstroms, mm -hmm. but, um, but yes. Okay. Thank you. That's, that is a, a viable option. Um, I'm going to share my screen just real quick to show y'all um, this reference library that I was referring to. Um, now I do believe that RSpec uses a version which has actually been um, resampled to be lower resolution to match a typical star analyzer. I think it may be a bit higher resolution um, by default, but it has a, a lot of different spectral types in that pickles library. Um, I'll see if I can find the ESA link and put it in the chat, but. So no, can... and I, I have a copy of RSpec, so. Okay, great. So. Great, yeah, I just, that's the uh, ones I use. I have to go find where the actual data is because I don't do calibration in RSpec. I do it in a piece of code I wrote myself. So, oh, cool. So. All right, cool. Well, um, it does at least look like these pickle spectra cover out to the the uh, reachable part of the passion <laughs> series. Yes. Okay. So what do you do with your star analyzer? Do you just push it further away from your camera? <laughs> um, yes, as a matter of fact. Okay. Um, I've, I have done the same. I started with a rainbow optics grading when I first started oh, cool. doing this. So on film. On oh, film. wow. That's how long well, ago I started. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That sounds really difficult to me. Um, I don't know how I could do it without live view. <laughs> yeah. um, I saw you. I think you gave you had this this uh, um, webinar, how to do spectroscopy or something quite some time mm -hmm. ago, right, Lauren? I um, did. I, I saw the, you have these enormous distances between the <laughs> the, the, the the grading and and but how do you get then in the, uh, into focus with with your camera chip that that was was well wondering me a little. Uh -huh. um, here, let me share my screen real quick. I'll show that that picture that you're referring to. Um, this is I, I have I've used this many spacers before, um, as much as will physically. Uh, work with my telescope before the grading's crashing into the secondary. The vignetting is horrible, of course, but the resolution's great. Um, um, don't you have a, do you, a, there's a moment arm there and flexor gets to be considerable. I have not found it to be an issue um, huh. with it, it. A lot of these spacers um, are very heavy duty because they're cannibalized from uh, filter 
holders. That's what these uh, Jumel ones over here are. Um, and then, yeah, I, I just generally have not found flexure to be an issue. They're pretty thick metal. What camera are you using? Uh, that one's a ZWO183MM Pro. Okay. Um, I've also used a 178mm in the past, uncooled. Um, and that was a that was a good one as well, but um, I found that the sensor size was a bit small for star hopping, and I wasn't actually using um, a tracking mount, uh, which ruled out plate solving. And also, there's a, the point where it's not tracking, so you want the target to stay in the field of view for a while. So large sensor really helped with that when I upgraded to the 183. Um, okay, so the question about focus. Um, one of the nice things about the star analyzer grading is that the distance from the camera um, does not actually affect the focus um, setting, at least not much. Um, I never had any problems with reaching a good focus with the star analyzer this far away from the camera. Um, it, it does become a bit more, well, I don't know that it's strictly becoming more astigmatic, um, it may just be that the higher dispersion is magnifying the astigmatism, but there is some astigmatism that I notice increasing with increasing spacing. Um, to deal with that, I just focus so that I'm focused on the spectral lines instead of on the zero order star image, or um, I, I, don't, I don't try and make the spectral strip as narrow as possible. It will be broad vertically, like it's coming from a slit spectrum of the sun or something. Um, at, at best focus, that astigmatism makes it broad vertically. So um, yeah, that's what I have to say on the topic of focusing with a bunch of spacers what, like what that. What scope are you using? Um, for, uh, for most of my spectra, I've been using a 12 inch Dobsonian. Okay. Um, I've also used an eight inch Dob and really the only difference is the aperture. Um, I wasn't able to use this many spacers with my eight inch though because the grading would have hit the secondary. Yeah, that, that was my question, basically, whether that, that is a risk, right, if you use a, a, a reflector, right? Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I, I see now, that's what you were asking about. So yeah, um, I, I very carefully measured the amount of spacers <laughs> that I could use. <laughs> okay. And um, as a matter of fact, um, I actually found it easier to do some parts of the setup with a lot of spacers, maybe not necessarily this many, mm -hmm. um, but with with this kind of setup um so the focuser it, it's resting back here right the shoulder or the top of the focuser um so the draw tube is enclosing all of this but then the rest of it is sticking out into mm -hmm. the tube where mm -hmm. i can access it so when it's time for me to rotate the grating to do alignment i can just reach in and rotate the grating without having to take the camera off the screen. oh you have, a, you have an open top zone yet, right <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay, you know, I understand. Oh, yeah, that's a different thing, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay. So it's it's um it's a non-traditional setup, <laughs> but, but um it it works. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Actually, I have uh, um, I have I've done spectroscopy at our nearby observatory where we have uh, slit spectrographs like the Dados and and, and mm -hmm. so on. But I wanted to do something with my uh, uh, refractor at home here, with also with the star analyzer. But I failed, but probably because the 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 the, the refractor is a um, achromatic. So I think that that is mm. probably the reason I could get great. Uh, uh, I mean. Like I could see the spectra, but no lines. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so now oh. I have, I have purchased. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm on uh, and um, and uh, triplet, and I hope that with this one, it's gonna go better, right? Well, when I first started working, I was using an Apo and a it was a six inch and a rainbow optics optics grading, and it worked fine. Mm -hmm. I had to tilt the the grading the the rainbow optics piece of glass a little but i figured out how to do that interesting i've i don't think i've ever heard of anyone um tilting it to make up for that but that's i guess that could that yeah that could work it very mm. very interesting so yeah it'll help in a little bit probably in your case too of being mm. um the vignetting of cutting off part of it if you get too far away from it. Mm -hmm. So, because it is bending things. 
Yeah, well, um, in, in my case, I fortunately did not run into um, vignetting of the spectrum by the okay. inside of the tube. Okay. The, the main vignetting that I ran into was because um, the star analyzer was sticking so far into the light cone, most of the light I mean, it was so far from being focused. The disc of light might be that big at this point, but the star going around, going going around it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, I started running into a practical limitation because with the reflector, the center of the light cone is hollow. There's no light coming from the secondary shadow. Right. So you can't, you can't I, stick the star analyzer down there infinitely because you'll stop getting any light at all. I have a, I have a Schmidt Cassegrain. So yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you ever worked with um, uh, uh, gratings uh, in front of the telescope? Object objective gratings, I think, is the expression. Any experience with that? Um, yes, I I have tried that with my star analyzer in front of one of my jobs. Um, rest of the aperture max masked off, of course. Um, I found that the aperture was simply too small to get anything of use. Um, I was able to just barely <laughs> see the spectrum of Polaris with mm. like 90 second exposures, mm. um, not remotely close enough to, um, not, not, not a high enough signal to noise ratio to see any spectral features. I could just barely detect the spectrum itself. Mm. So that was not really. No, the uh, only, way I've, only way I've heard of people doing that is to put a big prism in front of the, in front of the scope. But and that would be a dream. <laughs> yeah, and, and and not a small star analyzer. I mean, people. I, I know someone in here in Germany. He has, he has published also in in a journal here uh, how he's he's doing that pretty professionally and in with with uh, pretty big gratings, right? Which are as big as the telescope aperture, mm -hmm. right? And he's getting incredible resolutions. Yeah, so mm -hmm. much more than you could think with a grading, right? It, it's it's a bit well, like the, like yeah. like with a slit spectrograph, right? Right, gratings per per inch in the size of the mm. grading both come into the equation on resolution mm. so mm -hmm. yes you could get phenomenal resolution with that approach yeah with with a large surface is that um uh i'm gonna mispronounce his name i just know it but Uwe zermhol yes right <laughs> okay yeah I've, I've seen some of his um papers on that and that's really incredible work that he's yeah, doing yeah 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 very good at a I much cheaper seen... price than a slit spectrograph, right? Um, but uh, mm -hmm. okay, if you need to be, be able to make some constructions, I guess. I think he is he's very well in, in doing his own kind of setup yeah, that nobody else has. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I have seen um, success with, you know, other people doing it um, and not just in the hyper optimized configuration like Ui has, but um, also using a star analyzer but in those cases using something that has a very short focal length not like mm -hmm. me putting it in front of my dobsonian with a meter and a half focal length mm -hmm. um, but having it on like a camera lens or something um, i have seen usable results from that but to be honest i've never seen objective grading star analyzer results which were better than mm -hmm. having it in the converging beam even though the aberrations are less you're quite limited in what kind of dispersion you can achieve. And um, contamination is usually quite an issue with that sort of low focal length, um, wide field setup. Okay, anyone else have questions? All right, uh, I would like to ask, uh, in the equipment, uh, page that you showed us. Uh, what's the resolution that we should insert there for the oh. spectroscope? Because we have, uh, for instance, with the star analyzer, we can have the 100 and 200. We should use this this number as the resolution. That's a great question. I know that um, right now a fair amount of people do use that number because it's a it's an approximation that's usually in the right ballpark for a star analyzer. However, um, it's pretty easy to measure more precisely what you're getting out of your configuration. Um, and that way, you know, because it is possible to use a star analyzer and get R500 or R50. I mean, it really depends on how you have it set up. So um, mm -hmm. I'm going to 
share my screen real quick. Because uh, I measure mine and it's giving me around 700. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if it's okay. It's right. Mm -hmm. So um, actually, Andre, I saw um, in your latest email, you mentioned the way that you were measuring the um, resolution. So there's a resolution calculation, which is floating around out there, which gives the uh, theoretical resolution for a spectrograph that assumes that it is um, perfectly sampled with three pixels per spectral line. Um, that's usually not the case for amateur setups, particularly um, when you're using a star analyzer, because it just, it varies depending on your seeing, your optics. Um, usually you're sampling with a star analyzer at well above three pixels per spectral line. And that changes the resolution number when you go to compute it. So let me, um, let me find a good spectrum to, um, test resolution on. Uh, okay, so reference equals reference series. Okay, here's a random spectrum that I downloaded to check for AV spec a while back. Um, so this is would be how you measure the resolution in R spec, but you can do the same operation in any software. Um, it's just a mathematical operation, but I'm going to show you using the R spec tools. So um, the equation for resolution is, um, hold on a second. Um, all right, so uh, when you when you want to measure, wow, why is it doing that? Um, when you want to measure a resolution, you find a line which is intrinsically narrow. So um, not preferably not broadened by velocity or pressure. So like this, this hydrogen alpha line, very strong, but it's also very broad um, because of the pressure on the star. So not a good candidate for measuring your resolution. You want something like, um, um, like Carl had mentioned using a calibration lamp um, that will give intrinsically narrow lines for calibration. You could use something like that, or you can shoot a star and then just pick one that looks like it's around the limit of your spectrograph. So here we have some um, telluric lines visible in there in places. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna just say that this one here is intrinsically narrow. Um, forgive the part where the styling's weird. I was trying to style that plot earlier. Um, so I'm measuring the width of the line here using r uh, measurement tool. And it tells me the full width half maximum. That's the number that you want. Um, so in this case, the spectrum's already calibrated. It's already been converted to angstroms. And it tells me that the full width half maximum is 0 0.281 angstroms. And then um, to calculate the actual resolution of the spectrum, we take the wavelength that the line was measured at. So in this case, uh, it's about 6,550 angstroms, right? And then we divide that by the width of the line. So let me just get my calculator out here. <laughs> um, On 65, 500 angstroms divided by 0 0.281 angstroms uh, gives us a resolution quite high of about uh, 23,000. And that's, that's in the right ballpark for this kind of um, spectrum that was taken with a high resolution slit spectrograph. Um, it may vary depending on which line you pick um, a little bit. So if you want to be extra precise, you can measure several different lines and average the results that you get from them. But that's the, that's the procedure is you want to take the um, wavelength of a line divided by its full width half maximum, and that's your resolution. So I hope that that answers that question. Um, for, for, the, for, for, what they're, you, for what they're asking us to put in that block in, AV spec for the equipment. Should we do this somewhere around H alpha? Should we do this some, anywhere we want? Where, where do you want us to do this? Anywhere you want will work. Okay. Um, it The resolution will vary a bit across the spectrum, probably. 
um, but it's not enough to really matter for AB specs purposes. We're just trying to get something that's broadly accurate and it'll, it will, you, you're setting it on a, all of my spectra with this spectrograph are around this resolution level, but it'll probably vary even a little bit from spectrum to spectrum, just depending on if you have like, um, you know, in a slit spectrograph, if you have flexure or the camera gets bumped or something like that, you might have something a little lower resolution, but it's, it doesn't really matter. Uh, Lauren, I have a question about how you uh, measure the width of the line. Is it at essentially at the continuum point, or what you think would be the continuum, oh, sort of yeah. the base of the of the uh, artifact? Good, good question. Yes. So, um, when you're measuring the full attack maximum in software, it'll pretty much always um, get you to bracket in the line. Um, whether you're you're clicking on the continuum or you're doing like R spec and dragging these boxes to box it in, um, you're just trying to aim for the continuum, and it's relatively insensitive to exactly where you put it, but still try and get it accurate. Um, so like this difference here, uh, full attack maximum zero point three six four, full attack maximum zero point three four one. So it's it's relatively insensitive. Um, so but, it's pretty yeah. forgiving if you make a mistake. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. You just want to try and get it at about continuum level, but don't stress yourself too much about where exactly does the continuum start. Sure. Uh, also, a follow-on question about stating the resolution when we file our data. Um, I've been just filing a nominal resolution, which is conservative, rather than trying to actually measure it. Um, I suppose it's better if we measure it. How does that affect the quality of the data down the road? So um, it's fine to just file a nominal resolution as long as um, your nominal resolution is based on you've measured it you know, in the past. And so you, you have an idea of where your nominal resolution should be. We have occasionally had situations where um, someone doesn't realize you know, the, for the correct formula for resolution measuring or something like that. And they submit a spectrum that's about say R200, but it's labeled R2000 or something like that. That's when we, we would reject with a note to say, hey, please go measure and you know, fix the resolution in your equipment settings. Um, if, it's, if you're submitting a spectrum and it's R150 and you have it tagged R200, that's fine. Um, it's, it's close enough to filter by general resolution class. We just wanna keep it um, fairly close to the actual value. So don't worry about measuring it on a per spectrum level. If you if you do just as part of your workflow, because I know that we have some observers who do, that information does get preserved um, if it's in the metadata of the header of the FITS file, um, that will be preserved and that will override the um, resolution which you have specified in the equipment settings. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other questions about um, resolution? Just continuing, continuing my question. Um, should we report also the those informations in the FITS header using the BSS, for instance, ESRP, ITRP, and SRPW? Um, I'm not sure exactly off the top of my head, which, which header parameters those are. Um, if your header is not sufficient for submission to AV spec, it will tell you so when you submit. Um, if it's missing values, you know, when you, when you go to submit a spectrum, it just won't let you and it will say your header is missing these values. Um, please add them and resubmit. If you submit with um, erroneous values, obviously erroneous values, like in the case of we, we for some reason, um, get a fair number of submissions that have like resolution negative one or resolution eight or something like that. I think that occurs when um, people don't specify resolution in either their header or their equipment profile, and then there's nothing to go off of. Um, in those cases, I will see that when I'm validating the spectra and I will reject the spectrum with a note to please um, check your resolution settings.
All right, anything else on the topic of resolution? Just curious, Lauren, what are most people using? Um, <laughs> I don't know that we have a most category. Um, we have several observers who are using l high res spectrographs. Okay. Um, we also have a couple who are using LISAs and a couple who are using ALPIs and several who are using star analyzers. Um, so it's, I, I wouldn't say that there's a, a clear Am I the only one with a starlight? You may what, be. What is that, a slit or? It's a slit. OK, well, never heard. Starlight um, Express makes a makes a R2000 spectrograph. OK. Yeah, you, you may be. Um, let's see, what's your observer code again? Um, <laughs> I don't remember. That's all right. I don't. I, I have not submitted anything yet. So, oh, okay. Um, I have registered and I'm a member, but I have not submitted a okay. any of my. I, I'm still in that calibration loop, mm -hmm. working through my workflow. Right. Okay. Um. Probably you are the only one using a starlight spectrograph. Um. I. Th I think we have a couple of miscellaneous spectrographs you know home built or like mm. maybe that batter one um but most people are using either a star analyzer or one of the shellyak spectrographs um i don't have access to an actual like a list of all the equipment you know <laughs> sorted by um number of submissions to av spec i just right. am going off of um the little equipment label that i see whenever i approve a spectrum got it Lauren, uh, regarding the use of the star analyzer when you specify, does that go uh, the, the same specification when you hook it up with a prism, make a grism out of it? We just call that a star analyzer type uh, spectrograph. Is that right? It's home um, built. Yes. So I don't remember exactly which fields are on the form. Um, it would probably be helpful uh, if you could specify somehow that it has a prism you can say star analyzer grism um you can say star analyzer plus 3.8 degree prism um, i think that may be what i did on my own equipment um just some some way i don't i don't think we have like a dedicated option for it but in the title of the equipment maybe um, if you put the, the prisms present that will be helpful to me at least <laughs> yeah that's what i've done yeah okay great thanks that's what, what I did. That's what I did when I was using the rainbow optic screening. Nice. When when you use the star analyzer and the prism that Patton makes for that star analyzer, do you put the prism in front of the star analyzer or after the star analyzer, or does that make a difference at all? <laughs> that is another good question. Um, okay, hang on a moment while I pull up. I I did this sort of a mini study on this a while back. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just pull it up. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't an observational study though. I was just using uh, ray tracing. So uh, where'd it go? It might take me a minute to find it. Okay, here we go. All right, so here was uh, ray tracing for no prisms, one prism, and two prisms um, in various uh, configurations. And just based on looking at this ray trace, um, I decided that having the prism um, between the grating and the camera was probably best. Um, it seems like it results in smaller spot diagrams. Um, it also seemed like it maybe changed very slightly the wavelength of um, coma null, you know, the point on the spectrum which becomes the sharpest with no spectral coma when you're using a prism. Um, it seemed like it moved slightly in wavelength depending on which configuration, but honestly, not enough to matter. 
Okay, good. So, and um, let me see. I had another image that popped up that I think might have been relevant. So let me pull that up. Which is interesting because I was lucky I put mine behind without doing this analysis. <laughs> 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 I think um, that is also the only configuration possible when you're using a 200, because I don't think that's th fret threaded on the front, is it? No, you don't have threads on the front. But I, actually, I'm not using the Grism with the 200. I, I noticed that with the 100, it improves the, the resolution, but with the 200, uh, I, I actually, I never saw somebody uh, speaking about using the Grism with the 200, just for the 100. I think it was designed for the 100 specifically. I've, I've found um, from my own testing that it does help with the 200 up to a point. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share something different now. So this was, this was an observational test. Um, so this, this is actually kind of a grueling observational test. Um, I dedicated uh, several hours one night to PSIGME and tried out a whole bunch of different equipment variations and did all the realignments and stuff for each one of them. Um, so what I found was that the prism, as you can see, was helpful in sharpening the spectrum up to a point right here, about five inches or so of spacing. But then um, past that point, if I kept increasing the number of spacers, which most people aren't using this much spacing, but if I kept increasing it, the spectrum would actually sharpen um, by itself due to vignetting. Um, and so the sharpest spectrum of all was the one taken without a prism, but quite vignetted. Um, adding a prism to that configuration resulted in extra distortions because the prism itself does always add some base level of distortion, um, usually in the form of curved spectral lines. So um, yeah, basically, if you're using a low dispersion, the prism's quite helpful. Um, but if, if, you're, if your effective focal ratio is long enough, like for example, if you are using um, a really long focal ratio telescope, or you're vignetted so that you're only getting the central part of an aperture, um, without a prism is definitely best. So you're actually getting smiles, right? In your <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I didn't uh, quite make that up. Curvature in your spectrum, right? You have some oh, yes. <laughs> smile form here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that occurs with the, the prism at, um, and it becomes visible at high spacings. It's probably occurring at all spacings, but it's much, much, much smaller than the spectral coma at low spacings. Wow. Okay, anyone else have questions about um, star analyzers or prisms or anything like that? Just have a uh, question if you can hear me, okay? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, when uh, imaging the brighter standard stars, is it necessary to use darks? Um, that's a very good question. So <laughs> darks are recommended for spectra submitted to AVSpec. And we recommend in general that you follow the exact same procedure for your standard star spectrum, assuming that's the kind of standard star that you're talking about. I could be wrong. Um, we recommend that you you follow the same procedure as you would for any other spectrum submitted to AVSpec um, so that we can evaluate um, based on that. So personally, I don't use darks. That has to do with the type of imaging that I'm doing. Um, I'm generally stacking anywhere in the neighborhood of 200 to 2000 frames together. Um, they are all dithered the spectrum literally traverses the entire field of view, um, usually several times because I'm, I'm doing it with drift scanning. In fact, do I have an animation of, yeah, I do. Um, let me switch the screen share over. 
Um, so the way that I shoot spectra with my telescope, um, hold on, video players being a little weird. Um, hold on. There we go. So here's a here's a real time animation that I took. Um, so Earth rotating, stars shooting across the screen. Um, what this effectively means in terms of the usefulness of darks is that I've I've tested it. I've tested using a dark and darking each frame and then stacking them all together. Um, I've tested I think using a just a stack and a dark for the same exposure time. Or maybe I didn't do that. Well. Whatever the case, I found exactly zero difference because the, the dithering is so extreme here. Um, every frame has a different alignment. All of the noise is completely dithered away. Um, the amp glow for my camera is not particularly strong, especially at short exposures. Um, it's almost negligible. And then it's dithered until it's completely gone. So in short, I've, I've never found them to be useful with my mode of shooting. Chances are you're um probably using something that's a more traditional mode of shooting and in that case i say you should evaluate based on your camera you might want to do some tests seeing if you can tell any difference at all um, between a spectrum with and without darks the same spectrum you might even want to try making two versions of the spectrum one with darks one without darks and then um, subtracting or dividing them to see um, a graph of what the difference is if you have a lot of um, hot pixels or strong amp glow in your camera or something like that, then you probably um, will want to use darks. But if you if you really can't see a difference, then I'm not going to say that you have to. It's only a recommendation and not a requirement for AB spec. So okay, use common no sense. problem. I probably will use darks. I'm using a, an Orion G3 monochrome camera, mm -hmm. and it has a fair amount of hot pixels in it, so I'll probably I just didn't know if with brighter stars how big an issue it would be. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll go ahead and uh, test with both with, without darts and with darts. And the other question I have then is I'm just getting into the stacking aspect of this. And I tried DSS and uh, the other one is auto stacker. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a recommendation on for one that uh, has the lowest learning curve? Uh, well, <laughs> yes, I, I definitely have a recommendation for lowest learning curve because I've only found one software that actually works. So <laughs> it has the lowest learning curve out of all the ones which work, which is one. Um, and that software is Serial. Um, where did it go? What do you mean by the only only one that works? I oh, have that downloaded. That's what I also wanted to ask. <laughs> I did download that. I just haven't used it yet. Okay, sorry. I should have been. I should have been more clear. Um, I'm assuming that you're using a star analyzer, um, but are you are you using something else? No, I'm using a star analyzer. Okay, so I've never found software that will consistently register star analyzer images. There's lots that will stack them because stacking is a simple procedure, but the actual alignment of the yeah. different frames is what I've struggled to find anything that works. I've tried DSS. Um, I've tried auto Sackert, I've tried Registax, I've tried a few others. I don't remember. Maxim DL at one point. Um, yeah, that was a couple of years ago. I don't remember all the others that I tried. Uh, but I, Serial would be the one to go with. Yeah, Seri Serial for sure. Okay, um, got it. <laughs> yeah, because I'm, I'm stacking in Maxim, but, but I'm not doing a star analyzer. I have no zero order, so. Right. Yeah, it's a lot easier if you don't have to register the images. Right. No, and my 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 mount and spectrograph are so stable that I don't even have to align images. I can yeah, just stack. I can great. just stack them. So that's great. I'm I'm very much looking forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah, let's it, just a little quick around the the group instruments and mounts. What what's what are people using? So I'll yes. just, I'll go first. I have a Schmidt, uh, a Celestron Schmidt, eleven inch, on a CGXL mount, with a Starlight Express spectrograph, and a ZWO two ninety four. 
MM Pro, whatever the cooled one. So that's a nice setup. Yeah. Well, I have the uh, AstroTech RC8. That's what I have the uh, star analyzer mounted on with the uh, Orion G3. And then it's a tandem mount. I also have a Tech 140 uh, with a DSLR on it, which I do photometry with. I was going to get into the CCD photometry, but with the supply chain and the mess right now, I'm sticking with the DSLR. Mm -hmm. And those are mounted on a Paramount ME. Ooh, nice. Very nice. nice. Somebody spent some money. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got uh, a couple of different things. I've got two mounts. I have a, a CGX a Celestron, and I have a really old CG5, which has been kind of tuned up. Uh, on the CG5, I put a, a six inch Schmidt and just a standard star analyzer SA100 Grism configuration. And uh, then I also have a C8, standard C8. And um, I just, just now purchased an Alpi 600. Uh, I haven't figured out how to get that thing aligned yet, but uh, that's my basic setup. So nice. And the Congratulations camera, on I'm using an, an ASI 183 Pro, MM Pro. Good choice. I have a uh, RC telescope that I am currently using with a DSLR also like Dave and a Star Analyzer 200 in the focal beam. And that's my main setup right now that I'm trying to use to spectrophotometry so I can get spectra from multiple stars at the same time. I don't know if it's feasible or not yet. So I'm having to write my own code in Python to do to try to do that. And also for my fast Newtonian, I'm using a SEPSA spectroscope that I built using a IPs and variable slit and uh, the star analyzer 100 and the reason. And for that, I'm using like you used before the uh, ZWO as the 178 monochrome. And the spectra is much better with this setup, but actually, I can only observe one star at a time. So I'm starting with the uh, slitless setup first, and then I move to the SEPSA, SEPTA, SEPTA later. Very interesting. Anyone else want to talk about their equipment? I think that um, Paul was trying to talk earlier, but Paul, you should know that your audio was um, quite garbled. I have had that issue occur before in Zoom meetings. And um, I think the only thing that changed it was messing around in the audio settings and uh, switching to a different microphone. Yeah, that happens to me. Can you hear me okay now? Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. that it gobbles on some other webinars I do. Mm. Uh, I'm always just bouncing around with this, with the uh, spectroscopy. I have uh, an ASI 294mm, mm. an AVX mount, a C6, and a C8. And I've got uh, the, the grading, and I got a prism. And the one thing about the prism that I understand is you can put it in the front or the back of the grading, but if you put it in the back, it adds. I don't know, 14 millimeters to the distance or something mm -hmm. like that. So you're better off putting it in the front if you want to go that route. Hmm. I would personally say that the 14 millimeters of distance <laughs> is probably a good thing. Um, in general, I see that star analyzer spectra benefit from spacing, but then you've also probably seen that I'm pretty biased in that regard. <laughs> I, got the, I got the aspect that I've been using that uh, here. I actually bought from Tom Field is um, uh, the, the tube that's got all the LEDs on it. And you can play with this. It's like for a lab. So you can actually look at the various 
uh, wavelengths of the different lights that he has on there. I don't know how true it's calibrated, but if you go to his website, you can see that they use it for schools. So okay. I decided to get one for myself just to, on rainy days, I can try it out. Do that on some neon bulbs around the house. And cool. Practice the spec. Cool. But after talking uh, to some other people, I went to the SAS uh, online webinar and um, someone had brought up about Polaris. And I said, well, that makes it a heck of a lot easier for where I live in the city. I don't have to worry about meridian flips. I don't have to worry about anything. Mm -hmm. Aim it and get it in the field and have a better chance of you know doing something. I'd rather practice on that first than mm -hmm. do any submissions. That sounds like a good plan. So um, Paul, what kind of spacing uh, do you have out of curiosity? Like 50 millimeters? Um, you know, default nose piece or? Yeah, it's just a default. I've, I've also used a, a DSLR. I put it in the front, you know, and just do some white. Um, I think I tried Beetlejuice during the winter. That didn't come out too well. Again, I have mm -hmm. way too much haze here in, in, in Boston. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just actually not that far from ABSO myself. Oh, nice. Yeah, of course, they just moved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. But it's about 50, maybe 55, someplace around there. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a pretty good spacing. I've seen, you know, um, a lot of people use their star analyzers in filter wheels, which can be really useful from the perspective of both automation and limiting magnitude. But it seems like I'm always hearing from people who are are struggling with resolution with that kind of setup with only like 20 millimeter spacing. But 50, 55, that's a better sweet spot to be at. But if you put it in a filter wheel, you know, if you really have to spend a lot of time trying to screw it in the right way that you mm -hmm. lined up, because if not, it's going to be skewed on you. Yeah, and you have that's to end up doing that in software. Yeah, and to be honest, I've uh, I have a distrust for rotation tools and software when it comes to spectroscopy. I've never been able to software rotate one of my own spectra and not have it come out with some sort of rippling artifact. Right. So, our specs rotation you don't like? No, no. It it's um it, it makes those rippling artifacts, like I said. Hmm. It, the effects of that, I haven't tried. So, but I'm just guessing that the effects of that may be minimized um, when you're using a spectrum that is very tall, like a slit spectrum of the sun, um, and then you're averaging over a whole lot of vertical pixels. Um, but when you're rotating a star analyzer spectrum that's only a few pixels tall, it's quite pronounced. Well, let's take a look. Because I do it. The only way I can get to the far red end is to have the spectra diagonally across the chip. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Unless I go bit a really big chip, but that's right. expensive. Do, do, you, do you need zero order? Why don't you just take part of the spectrum on a red? No, no, no. Like, so the maximum, like, the only place I can actually view or get the, the spectrum on the chip is is by rotating the camera. I have no lateral control of the, the way the spectrograph mounts to the to the to the camera. So okay. I'm I'm at, at the extreme of where I can can uh, do all of the adjustments. Okay. So if I had a full frame CCD or a full frame CMOS chip, I could probably do it across the flat part of the space, but I'm, my chips, what, 15, 15, 18 millimeters across. Mm. Um, and there isn't one that has the same QE um, as the 294. So since I'm shooting very, very dim objects, I went for a maximum QE camera instead of a bigger chip. So um, you're saying that this starlight spectrograph, there's no way to like rotate the grating or pivot the camera or anything like that. No, the grating is fixed mm. to the to the output port. It's a it's a the grating is um, a I don't know if it's uh, parabolic or what the mirror is, but the grating is actually on one of the mirrors. Oh, interesting. And and. Uh, I forget the design. You can look it up. It's on their their website. But um, and I have the non-pro version. I have the the 
they sold a version for a while which was um purely mechanical so all the adjustments are screws or 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 stuff on the outside they make the the current one which is the pro which is set up to run through a usb port and you can mm -hmm. do all of the controls with that but um but yeah no there is no adjustment to changing and grading or doing anything like that interesting so the only way i could do it is rotate the camera so. mm -hmm. interesting but it I'm will go on. if you had if you had a 31 millimeter across chip the spectrograph will go out to 9000 so nice yeah, and at the other end of the range, just if anybody's interested, it, it will go down to 3,500 on the other end. So nice. You've got pretty much everything visible there. <laughs> my can it, it matches the camera's capabilities quite well. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, Lauren, I've got a question um, about equipment. Uh, for those that have the um, uh, Schmidt cast range, a 6, 8, or 11, uh using a star analyzer setup whatever it might be uh what's your opinions or the group's opinions about the use of the focal reducers uh does it help does it hinder uh any ideas there any experience that's a that's an interesting question i would say that a focal reducer is almost always going to harm more than it helps with a star analyzer um in general there's well there's multiple things going on um with a star analyzer your spectra are going to be better at longer focal ratios because the spectral coma will be a lot less you can compensate by for spectral coma by some amount with a prism but it's really best if you can um you know not uh just not have as much to deal with in the first place because the prism is not a cure-all um and I, th I am not familiar actually with hands on using a focal reducer myself, but it sounds like um, it would limit the um, length of the draw tube or the amount of spacers or et cetera that you could use pretty considerably. Um, is that correct? I mean, it would be a piece of glass that's there and, blocking and, your grading. And, right. And then the other thing I would suggest, and again, not hands on, just theoretically. Um, you would need, or to be accurate, you would have to have the zero order image in the same place when doing your calibration, because if you had the zero order someplace else on the focal reducer, you may not have the same glass you're looking through. Mm. That That's true. Um, if you left the focal reducer in all the time, that would be your standard, then you would develop that protocol that, uh, I've seen, you know, pros and cons. Uh, I think one of the advantages of the focal focal reducer is it reduces the actual pixel size of the uh, target star. So the stars are slightly smaller because the field of view is larger, it's more compressed. So um, it would, you know, uh, it makes the star size smaller, which makes the spectrum, it could improve the uh, resolution of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. But the offset is uh, you have steeper optics, so he is more, you know, more prone for optical problems, like you talked about. Since the cone, as it approaches the, the focal plane, is steeper, um, then it's more, you know, uh, more difficult to get everything on alignment. Uh, if you use the, if you don't use a a focal reducer on an F8, excuse me, on an F10 Schmidt, then you have a pretty lengthy backspace. To the focal plane and uh so that you have to keep that in mind and the focal reducer shortens that whole mechanical advantage as well so it makes the the uh the camera a little bit closer to the uh, scope mm -hmm. and uh, it balances better but you know i, I think I've, I've heard opinions on both sides for you know a couple of years in reading and i just wondered what the experience was in in this group mm -hmm. What about just the opposite of using a barrel lens? That's uh, that's another good question. I have not done that um, myself, and 
to be honest, I, I don't think I know anyone who has either. Um, I, I can't think that it would improve the spectrum a whole lot because you're still running into issues like, um, so generally, um, if you're, if you're adding a Barlow and it's, you know, the light's hitting the Barlow before it hits the star analyzer, um, you are having the opposite effect. You might be removing some of the spectral coma. So that's good. You're probably also adding a little bit of chromatic aberration that, that's not unique to the Barlow. That would probably also happen with the focal reducer. Um, and that's just the effect of having glass in the way. Um, and you're bloating the star image a bit because chances are you weren't completely undersampled before. So now you're magnifying the star image a bit. So that would reduce resolution. Personally, I would rather shoot with a Barlow than a focal reducer if those were the only two options. You know, I'd, I'd pick the Barlow because I'd rather have the very uniform and predictable loss in resolution, which comes from a larger star image, as opposed to the non-uniform and non-predictable uh, blurring from spectral coma. It is asymmetric and it is, you can't, you can't exactly correct for it. Um, and it can masquerade as velocity effects in some spectra. Um, like we had some spectra coming in of Nova Cassiopeia 2021, um, which had that very broad, beautiful emission, very bright. That was unfortunately, and I still don't know um, what exactly a solution to this would be, but if, if there were people who are shooting with star analyzers, those spectra naturally had spectral coma, that bright emission would appear to become asymmetric because of the spectral coma. The NOVA emission was not necessarily actually asymmetric, but it looked for all the world like it was in this spectrum because you can't tell looking at the 1D spectrum whether it's spectral coma or a real effect. Um, so that's, I, I like to avoid spectral coma if at all possible is what I'm saying. So I'd pick the Barlow, but I'd probably first pick not using a Barlow or a focal reducer at all. <laughs> Folks, I need to step out. Thanks a lot. I think it was a good discussion. And I'm- Yeah, thank you very much for, for joining us. See you in us. the future. Thank you, bye. Yeah, see you. Uh, Matthias, real quick. Yeah. The meeting info, the login info is going to stay the same. So um, if you want to attend again, feel free to use the same stuff that was yeah. emailed to you. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 I have a quick question, Lauren. Um, I read, I, I think I read someplace that said you would take spectra that had not been instrument response calibrated. Is that true? Yes, that is true. Um, okay. A significant fraction of our spectra are not corrected for instrument response. Okay. That's something that we would like to track in the future, but we're not going to forbid submitting spectra without instrument response. It would just be nice to have a, like a flag in the metadata that says this one's been an instrument response corrected, this one hasn't. Um, that's something we're working on. You want it in the header or what? In the optional comments, something? Um, yeah. So, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the technical implementation details are going to be because it's not in AV spec yet, but we're looking at including it in the header. And then um, if it's not included in the header, um, we may be able to just specify it on the page, like at the time of upload, check okay. this box if it's instrument response corrected, you know? All right, well, I'll just, if I can find some, some spots in the comments, I'll just start adding it, so. Great. Because my intent is to do it for all of them, because that's what I do for myself. So. Uh -huh. Great. That's that's a good habit to be in. <laughs> <laughs> it takes extra time. You got to go shoot calibration yeah. stars, but, um, but yeah, I, but, it, it's good practice. So. Yeah, and and it does increase the usefulness of the spectrum for researchers. So. It's a whole lot of it's a whole lot of work on the workflow, though, for sure. I know. So. Yeah. Very very time consuming. So um, if you ever if you ever find yourself with a batch of spectra that you know you're not going to be able to instant response correct, feel free to upload them anyway. But like like I said, we we will accept them just the same as if they were instant response corrected. It's just okay. a nice bonus. Okay, so I have some wonderings on the demand side. Is anybody saying what they're looking for or what they'd like us to go get? I mean, I have my own curiosity ones, but um, to help advance science with so you know i have a 2000 r2000 spectrograph which is probably not what most amateurs have mm -hmm. but um are they looking for anything in particular 
Um, great question. So we do have um, occasionally alert campaigns that come through um, requesting spectra and the details are in each individual campaign for what type of spectra and what targets right. will be useful. Um, I, I don't know right now if we have like a central repository um, for that information. We are uh, in the future going to be, um, hold on, let me pull up. So we are um, hoping to list some projects on the actual uh, AV spec page that once we, once we have um, talked to some professional astronomers and let them know that AV spec is a resource that they can use and ask them what kind of spectra they want to see. Um, we, we're going to list that information there on AV spec so that people have some sort of a guide for right now. Um, hold on, I'm still getting to the page. We do have a um, list of projects on the spectroscopy section page. Okay. Um, here we go. Okay, so here's the spectroscopy observing section page. Right. Um, and then down, way down here, um, okay. it's a list of program priorities for the spectroscopy observing section. Okay. Technically a different entity from AV spec, but all of their recommendation, recommendations are good. And um, if, and if you see anything on here on this list that you'd like to monitor, that's, those are spectra that are um, known to be active topics of research and spect that spectra would help, so. Yeah, I hope that was clear. <laughs> okay, I've seen this, but okay. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, that's that's the resources that I know of right now. That and the alert notices. Is is that instrument response only for slits, or is that also for gratings? Um, it's also possible to do instrument response correction on gratings, and we do encourage it if you if you can do it. Um, Could you just give me a definition of that? Sure. So um, instrument response correction is um, a process that you can apply to change your the shape of the continuum of your spectrum, basically. Um, when you take a spectrum, its raw continuum will be heavily shaped by the sensitivity of your camera and the, how transmissive the air was at that point in time and that kind of thing. And losses so, of the scope. So yeah, losses of the scope. Yeah, there's basically anything that the light interacted with um, after it left outer space and you know started to enter the Earth's atmosphere, pretty much anything it interacted with will have an effect on its spectrum. And you can control for that um, with instrument response correction by taking a spectrum of a star that has a well-known standard spectrum. So you take your own spectrum, you compare it to the well-known standard spectrum, which has been corrected already for all those effects. And then you divide, um, I don't remember if it's your spectrum by the standard or the standard by your spectrum. It's, the, stan it's the standard by yours. Okay, thanks, and then, thanks Carl. And then you multiply your resultant target by mm -hmm. that same, the result of that division. So yes. basically, if you were to, to divide your standard star by your correction, you would get the known um, star spectrum. and mm -hmm. You do that same process, multiplication, take your instrument response, multiply it by your observed spectrum, and you will get what you think is the spectrum of the star target that you're interested in at the edge of the Earth's atmosphere, at the top edge. So as if you were seeing it without having gone through all of the things which rob of photons. So. Mm -hmm. Can you show them, show them an uncalibrated um, Vega and a calibrated Vega, sure. in, in, and that's a good example. Sure. And also, um, I'm going to paste the link right here in the chat. Um, this is for RSpec, which I'm making an assumption that you use, Paul, um, but the procedure is the same no matter which software you're using. It's just which buttons you click will change. Um, that's, a, that's a tutorial for doing it in RSpec. Um, and then I'll, I'll go ahead and pull up a comparison, but that's going to take me a minute, so oh, yeah. I want to keep talking. That one. That's, that's a good one. What? The, oh, the, the image that she just sent, the, the link, the field test. Right. Yes. Our spec is, our spec say, is, is very, very, very capable. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You know, I, I know Vega is used as, as a test and everything, you know, to, to baseline. But, 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 right, but, but in, in our spec, um, as she was talking about when I asked the question about what to calibrate against, the whole um, database of targets that are there as references are available for you to use to calibrate against. Okay. So you can use, if you go look, I, I don't know, do you have an observatory program? Um, something to point to, to, to know what stars you're looking at or want to look yeah, at? I have a couple different software packages. Okay, like the sky or yeah. anything like that. It will tell you what the star, the classification of the star in most cases. Mm -hmm. Okay, especially for the brighter ones. Um, you can then look that up in the database within RSpec and use that as a target. So um, a, a, a star, a type stars are very, very stable as far as their spectra, um, even out through late F, actually even mid G, um, those, those spectra are fairly stable over time. Right. Um, once you start getting to G giants and K stars, they become variables. So you have to watch out um, when looking at those. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, standards. So Good advice. And, Thank you. and and don't don't use an M. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless it's a dwarf. An M dwarf is is a viable standard. Mm. M giants are not viable standards. <laughs> I still wouldn't use a, an M dwarf just because um you're the shape is going to be changing so drastically with resolution, at least on the low end. Yep. Well, no, and and again, I would pick standards that are probably where you are are most brilliant where you want to be observing. Mm -hmm. If you are observing mid visual, then you probably want A's through F's because that's where they have the the largest flux. Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking out in the deep red like I am, it's harder. <laughs> Mm -hmm. when you're when you're trying to divide a very small number by another very small number um the amount of error which gets brought in is considerably larger right so that's a good question uh on the myras uh the far you know the the, the uh, m stars what is everyone using for instant response are you because i've had a lot of trouble using an a type star to instrument response and m variable Right. So, so again, I, I would go out through probably late F or mid G. Okay. So um, one thing that I want to bring up just because it messed me up uh, for probably over a year with my own spectra, um, because I, I didn't remember ever seeing this piece of advice anywhere, um, was that you must perform background subtraction before you do your or before you create your instant response curve. Oh, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. You'll get very bizarre results if you don't. <laughs> well, you, what, you're, what you're effectively doing is that you're putting a platform underneath your star. Yeah. It's pushing it all up. And then their division is wrong because you're not taking account this platform that is background that's pushing the star up. And it's not uniform either. Mm -hmm. So darks will push up the whole spectrum a given amount. Poof. Pretty much just a level flat um, surface um, but background will do it more background is not that important in short shots but if you're doing very long shots or, or slitless the background is there so yeah yeah and i found major consequences to my instant response correction doing slitless i i did not know for over a year why they kept going wrong and then it turned out to be background subtraction. And that's something that I don't think is mentioned um, or at least not emphasized in the RSpec tutorial. So I wanted to make sure that when you, all of you here know that. Right. If you go over and look in the RSpec, if you go over on the left, can you expand the left side a little bit, uh, yeah. Lauren? The background subtraction is right down here in the bottom left with the little checkbox. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And in your case where you have this big wide spectrum, you don't want to be doing it right where it suggests, but you want to do a custom area. So mm -hmm. click custom region. Yeah. 
and and then you can put it wherever you want it to take the background out so yeah this here um obviously is not the same spectrum i was showing on the right this is one that my right. friend tim took um it's solar but um it is a good example and i'm glad that you brought this up um so whenever i'm doing background subtraction i try to take as large of a sample as i can the automatic background subtraction in our spec is, is just not sufficient um 20 rows is nothing on at least my camera sensor. Um, so I, I use this custom region like you were talking about. If you're using slitless, make sure that you don't get any stars in your background sample. There are some instances where you may, if you're going for extra super precision, um, in the case where you're shooting a really faint target with slitless or something like that, you may want to profile the background separately as if it were its own spectrum this is before calibration, so don't calibrate it, but profile it separately and then trim out any contaminating background stars. Just delete those pixels and smooth the whole thing because it will be some no amount of noise. You can smooth out the noise. Um, that's OK. Just don't change the overall shape of the background. And then you can use that as your background sample if you're going for really, really, really high signal to noise ratio. You know, Lauren, I found another little trick with our spec. Uh, when you do the background subtraction and you select your, your upper and lower areas, um, if you go to the histogram and, uh, and stretch the histogram a whole lot, you will find all of those mm -hmm. faint stars that are going to end up being subtracted from your data. And so I, I try to stretch it a lot and then I find a selection of, a, of the background that does not have or has a minimum amount of that um, foreign data in there. That seems mm -hmm. to help quite a bit too. Yeah, I'm just showing the histogram here that you were talking about so that anyone Hit, else who uses click, our spectrum. Click the entire image. I, I am about to. It's just, it's very laggy on my computer. <laughs> when doing this, yes, this is very, very laggy. Yeah. Very laggy. Wow. <laughs> I, I do have to go. This is really good. I appreciate this. And uh, hopefully I'll be back next time. Okay, great. Thank, thank you for joining us today. Looking really, forward to the next time. Everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I guess I should go ahead and ask, are there any uh, other questions that any of you have been holding on to, haven't been addressed? Um, I have a question now. When uh, registering uh, your site in the AAVSO uh, sites menu, how accurate do you have to have the uh, latitude and longitude in other words is 40 degrees good enough and 82 degrees or do you want more information than that um honestly i i don't know um what our criteria are for that if we have any um yeah, i looked at some of the spectra and some people you know go out quite a ways other people just give the degrees and i wondered if you you have a standard uh, as far as what you want? Uh, we don't have a standard as far as I know in terms of how precise you should be. Myself, I'd probably put in two decimal digits, but um, that's not like that's an official recommendation. That's just what I would do. Right. Um, so yeah, um, I would say as, as long as you're precise at least to a degree, you're probably fine. Um, I don't know what that information is used for, if anything. OK, thanks. No problem. Oh, um, Dave, by the way, uh, uh, the one who is not Dave Decker, <laughs> what's what's your last name? Um, I'm just wondering if you're on this list that I was sent earlier. Hopefully, uh, Morgabacher, M-O-H-R. OK. D-A-C-H-E-R. Uh, thank you. Um, OK, so you already said that it was fine if we record this session and, and post it. Um, yeah, that's not a problem for me. OK, great. That means that everyone here gave their consent and we will be able to upload the recording. So if any of you want to go back and check something that was said, you can do that. Um, it'll and be on the One, one other channel. question, too, while I'm thinking of it before I forget. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, OK, we talked a little bit about darks. And if I go to do flats or whatever, a beginner's question. Uh, should the star analyzer be on or off? Don't do flats with the star analyzer. Um, 
that's a common point of confusion. We're going to publish some official guidance on that point, but it's unfortunately, at least with um, current standard procedures in the amateur community, it's not possible to accurately flat a star analyzer um, because the spectrum is produced, the, the light from the spectrum um, is produced well after the aperture of the scope. Um, if you correct for vignetting in the scope, that's actually uh, distorting the continuum of the spectrum because the spectrum was not affected by that vignetting from the scope. The spectrum, um, you know, if there's any vignetting, it's happening between the grating and the camera, but usually there's nothing vignetting there. So, um, and there's other effects like thin film interference, which are, those are normally, um, that kind of aberration is normally corrected by flats in a slit spectrograph, but it requires that the wavelength be static with respect to the pixels in the frame. And that's not happening with a star analyzer. Your spectrum's always moving at least a little bit. So, um, you know, between frames. Well, bottom line is keep the um, analyzer off when doing flats. Bottom line is don't do flats for your, your star analyzer spectrum. Oh, okay. Um, it's, okay. it's just not possible to do them accurately. Um, okay. And I least... don't, I don't even do flats in a slit mm -hmm. to be hundred percent. Okay. I thought I read somewhere where uh, flats weren't required, but were recommended. So that's the reason mm -hmm. I was they're, asking. They're recommended, but again, she, as she said, don't do them for slits. But... Okay. Yeah. We have not had um, enough clear guidance about flats in particular in the past. So um as we've been working on making updates to AV spec, that's kind of near the top of the list is publish some clear instructions um, regarding flats. Okay, thanks. No, and, oh. and here is my two cents, and this came from a professional astronomer as well. If you put the star in the same equipment at the same location as relative to where the slit is, that flats will come out via uh, instrument response and mm -hmm. and you don't need the to have done the flat so um but that's my two cents i i believe that is correct yes um as long as it's all completely you know reproducible um right in terms of location right because what you're trying to get is instrument response changes via location relative to the the sensor mm -hmm. and and take those variations out but like i said if you're not using if you're not changing the position of the star or the spectra in the slit then then calibration takes or instrument response takes them out mm -hmm. just the same so okay i i have one Thing on this topic that I would like to share. It's going to take me just a moment to pull up. Um, Relative to flats? Uh, yes. Well, okay. I'm, so, so if, if I were to do flats, what is the recommended source to do flats with? Because here's where the amateur community has a real problem. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I've honestly, I've never used a slit spectrograph, and that's one thing that I've never learned is um, what what sort of source you should be using for your flats um, for best results. So sorry, I don't know. So I don't know. what I've seen them use in professional telescopes is an illuminated screen that they point the scope at inside the dome, mm -hmm. but I don't have a dome <laughs> <laughs> yet. Um, but um, yeah. And then the only other source I've seen is some some things that are available to stick over the end of the scope and be a flat source. Mm -hmm. Um but don't have one. So Yeah. I can mention uh talk a little bit about flats for not spectroscopy but just general um uh, imaging. Oh, well, then uh, or, then it or... then it's then I think it's required. Yeah, uh, for EAA or whatever you're doing. Right. And I've tried various light sources, none of which have ever given me a good flat. Uh, I still like the sky. I go out there in the daytime, point away from the sun, and uh, use a white t-shirt, pull it tight over the front of the scope, 
and I get the best flats uh, better than any of the light sources I've used. Mm -hmm. So um, it's convenient, it doesn't cost anything. Yeah, so, uh, so that, that, that is, again, if I was going to do flats, it would be go out before dark and get yep. sky images. Unfortunately, yep. though, um, that won't work for spectroscopy because you will have the um, solar absorption lines. The sky right. scatters those and you don't have a smooth wavelength source. So, right. so I've been told, what is it? Uh, a um, There's a specific source that is used for those, a warm source that has no lines in it. Um, is it a Incandescent? halogen? And so I think it's an halogen light, isn't it? That sounds right, yeah. Yeah, so, but now you have to illuminate something with it, so. Yeah. That's, that's big enough for your scope to see, so. Yeah, I, uh, I what I would say is that you sh uh, might want to look into what the uh, French spectroscopists in the Spectro ARS group are doing, okay. because they do flats and they do them well. Um, I don't know what procedure they're following, but I'm oh. pretty sure that if you if you did the same thing as them, then you'd be doing a world class okay. flatting procedure. I will look. So um, on the topic of flats, I just want to show real quick um, an example of uh, why repeatability of location in the frame is important. Um, and also a little bit of a PSA about thin film interference. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. This is a kind of a fast animation. Um, there we go. So this is a spectrum of the red end of Vega um, because Vega doesn't have much going on in its red end. Um, and it's panning quickly up and down. So this the spectrum was taken um, allowing Vega to drift vertically so it covered the entire frame. So it's like it's like a slit spectrum of the sun, only Vega. Um, and you can see that there are some spectral features that are not moving left to right. So those ones that aren't moving are in Vega, but then there are some that are, they're broad ripples and they're moving left to right as we pan up and down the frame, right? Yep. So those yep. ripples come from um, thin film interference in the sensor of the camera. Right. There are also small scale ones that can come from the um, cover window or cover glass in a camera is another commonly observed one, but that's much smaller scale. Um, and these are the main reason why it's important to do uh, flats with slit spectrographs. They do show up in slitless. This is a slitless spectrum, but there's not really anything that you can do about them in slitless because they do move across the frame. What's happening is that um, on different parts of the sensor, the angle of the incident light is different. Um, the light cones coming in at a slightly different angle to focus and that means that um, the sensor substrate from the perspective of the light appears to be, you know, if it's coming straight on, it's a little bit thinner. If it's coming tilted, it's a little bit thicker and that changes the wavelength. Um, and it's just good to be aware that these ripples exist. They're different for each camera, but they will be there pretty much. Um, and they are removed by flats if you're using a slit spectrograph. Or instrument response correction if you have a very repeatable location in the frame, um, like Carl was talking about. So that's that is my method right now to avoid having to find the equipment to do flats with, mm -hmm. is by putting the star in the same place in the slit approximately every time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to get back to standard stars again being brighter. Uh, typical exposure with my scope is maybe seven seconds. But uh, should I be stacking or not as far as uh, those short exposures go? Um, yes, I would recommend that you, well, honestly, I would recommend that you always stack your images just because of it improves the signal to noise ratio. But and in how, particular, how for, um, so I would say that you want to always have a total exposure time longer than a minute if you can manage it. Um, Wow. Well, not, not on individual subframes, but at least on your stack. Um, I've heard the, the number 45 seconds thrown around before. I say a minute just to allow a little bit of safety margin there. For, for, for basically, based on what, 
What drives right. the minute? I'm, a, I'm about. Um, okay. So basically, um, atmospheric scintillation can change the continuum of a spectrum. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with like looking at Sirius rising or some other bright star and seeing it twinkle and look a bit rainbow. That effect will come through in your spectra if you're using a short exposure. Um, it, some a spectrum may look artif artificially ish um, enhanced in the blue or the red okay. because you caught it during a time when it was twinkling blue or red. So um, you can average that out, and the the commonly quoted figure is 45 seconds. Um, in order to average that out at typical shooting altitudes, you would probably need longer if you're shooting very very close to the horizon. Um, and like I said, I I say a minute because it's not um, usually too much harder to go to a minute and that gives you a little bit of a safety buffer. Um, but your instrument response correction won't be able to correct for atmospheric scintillation because that's so time dependent. So it's best to just average it out. Smooth it out. Okay. Now I understand. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's easy with mine because Vega takes me 20 seconds by itself for one shot. Ah. So so at my dispersion. So I'm uh, yeah. I'm I'm at 0 0.9, 0 0.95 angstroms per pixel. So mm -hmm. um and does that give you a sorry, go ahead. Considerably less sensitive than the star analyzer. Mm -hmm. Does that give you a um like a well exposed image, like centered on the histogram, or is that how much you need to have usable signal? um that's usable no that's that is for a bright object um 30 seconds is fine and it gives me a well-centered distribution um but my target of choice are carbon myras so mm -hmm. i'm trying to shoot magnitude 10 11 12 mm -hmm. stars and uh so my exposures, total exposure time are in the single digit hours. Ah, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, that's that's faint for spectroscopy. I'm glad you're monitoring those stars, though. Not many people are. That's, that was what one of the questions was, is that, um, and I've just gotten back into this last couple of months. Um, I did a very, very extensively in the 07, 09 timeframe. Mm -hmm. um, I had a different spectrograph. I had a, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Santa Barbara Instruments DSS-7. Um, Very vaguely. But, but it was a slit. It is a slit spectrograph. I still have it. Its resolution is in the 500 range. Um, um, and um, maybe five, 600. Um, and um, very nice instrument. Um, I was using that with a ST402, a very, very sensitive CCD, but my CCD broke and I don't want to pay to get it fixed. It was kind of a niche item in the first place. And a new one is probably more expensive than the CMOS cameras that I have now. So I'll go with these. But um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm just back into it, just getting started, um, seeing how far, how dim I can, can go. So um we'll see how this pans out nice well i'm glad you're getting back into it and i'm looking forward to seeing your spectra start to come into av spec but back to the question how long to stack uh, i understand the 60 seconds now so that's probably a good good point um you can also avoid it by taking them over several different exposures so take a shot of it go someplace else come back take it again go someplace else, take it again, and you'll get rid of a little bit of that. Now you have to watch about how much air mass you got involved, but um, if taking shots at different air mass are going to change your instrument response. But I would, I would say um, that you're still going to need a total, total of... exposure. Yes, I yeah. agree with you. Yeah. And the scintillation itself, um, this kind of scintillation, the colorful kind, is on the time scale of, you know, seconds, right. uh, single digit seconds. So I wouldn't say that you get much advantage by um, switching targets in between. I'd say you can just stay on the same target. Same, same, just take them, take them and stack them all. Yeah. 
Con consecutively is fine. That'll slow you down a little bit. <laughs> Can't well, be bouncing around the know, sky. So. <laughs> I I don't know. I think uh I think if you're not spending one minute on your target anyway, then <laughs> probably you're doing some really specialized observing. <laughs> you had mentioned earlier that you use uh, extenders to uh, you know get a wider spectrum, mm -hmm. and I'm using our spec, and I take a that's what you're using too. Mm -hmm. So if uh, you know the zero order is not in the spectrum anymore, how do you, what are you doing to calibrate? <laughs> that's that's a great question. Um, it's a problem that I haven't fully solved yet. With some stars, if you know if there's a negligible um, redshift or, or blue shift velocity effects involved then I just calibrate on the star's spectral lines um, using known wavelengths from different reference texts. Um, in the case of stars where there is some sort of noticeable redshift or blue shift going on, like P. Cygni. P. Cygni has consistently given me kind of trouble with that. I don't think that I'm off by much on P. Cygni, but I, <laughs> I probably but, am off by some amount because I'm but, calibrating but, on the emission. Right. No. But okay. But if if you were to calibrate on a standard star for that night, mm -hmm. so you go off and you take some A zero star, and um, as long as it's somewhere near the same air mass or the same def same kind of the only thing, that, but if you took a standard star and you calibrate that, that calibrates your instrument. And the only thing that you're not calibrating for now is flexure. If you were to look at a different star at the same air mass. Um, yeah, so that would be true if I were using a slit spectrograph, but um, I've been using a slitless grading, the star analyzer. And in that case, the spectrum where it appears in the field of view is almost random. I can try and line it up in the same spot, but I can never get it to pixel accuracy. No, but you, why does it need to be pixel accurate? It's it's from zero order. Uh, that was actually um, the question. I, I believe that's what Dave was asking about because my spacing is so high that the zero order won't fit on the camera sensor. Okay. In fact, at times, not even the whole spectrum will fit on the camera sensor. In the case of... Um, but I, Okay, I've, so it's... A, is, so is your distribution nonlinear? It would be. Uh, it is a bit, well, some, sometimes. It depends on whether I'm using a prism, which as you've seen, I've, I've done a lot with and without. Right. Um, but the, the main issue is I can, I can repeatedly calibrate if a star is a well-behaved star and doesn't have redshift or blue shift going on in its lines. Right. Um, the issue for me comes up with weird stars like P. Cygni that have the weird emission absorption profile. And I don't know where exactly is the rest wavelength of the line. No, I understand that. But what I'm, my, my put was to argue the fact that you go calibrate your instrument and therefore the distance from here to here is so many angstroms and from here to here is so many angstroms right right that's that's correct and i i have that information but um it's not anchored on the x-axis so i can say i know exactly the difference between four uh, thousand angstroms and five thousand angstroms but i can't say where in the image is four thousand angstroms you don't have the telluric oxygen 7602 well, I do if I'm on the red end, but right. if um, in these cases, my spacing is often so high that I don't have that anchor point. Ah, uh, there you go. Okay, so there's the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's you the need, problem need, is missing anchor you points. You can calibrate your instrument, you just can't calibrate an anchor point. So, right. okay. Yeah, and it, it is, it's a limited scenario where that occurs yeah. um, because, you know, oftentimes I do have the uh, oxygen anchor point or the zero order anchor point, but it's, um, I think Dave was asking about when I use my maximum spacing, which is, it's impractical. It was fun to experiment with, but it's impractical. And you'll notice um, I don't have any spectra in AV spec with that instrument. <laughs> <laughs> did actually, actually, did you actually get better resolution by doing that? That's a, really? that's a fun question. Y yes, qualified yes. 
um, because I found that I was starting to lose resolution uh, due to diffraction with I was vignetting to such an effectively small aperture that diffraction was starting to become relevant. However, um, you know, the airy disk was becoming larger, but also um, it was more repeatable that way because that resolution loss was due to, you know, the star image was getting larger, um, but the spectrum was also getting longer. So it was more like, you know, every time I take out the telescope with spacing that large, I'm getting pretty much the same result. It was like that kind of thing. If I go to a shorter spacing, then on nights of good seeing, where the star is very small, I can get better resolution. But on nights of poor seeing, um, the the dispersion is is too low, and I get significantly worse resolution. Where are you, Lauren? Um, right now I'm in Oklahoma. I, okay. I used I done almost all of my spectra from Texas, though I, I moved okay. recently. It was in the Houston area, where um, fortunately we often had relatively good seeing. I mean, as good seeing as you can get at sea level, but there would be also a lot of sea haze, so bad transparency. No, because I, I was spoiled. My first days were out in the southwest. Oh, and, yeah. And I had a dark site, which was my backyard. Um, I was behind a hill from town and, and pretty much didn't see any town glow and uh and beautiful absolute beautiful nights but now i'm in the southeast i'm in tennessee so mm. a lot more water in the air yeah still get decent spectra though so. great well i got some very nice um spectra of telluric water from houston <laughs> <laughs> No, it's interesting that you're talking about the oxygen lines to just to give you an idea when I first took the first spectra and tried to focus this camera. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the areas I was focusing in. If you look on the right side, the red side of telluric um, oxygen, you see the little dips as you come up back up to continuum. Mm -hmm. And I can just start seeing those in my spectra. That's, yeah, that's, that's great. It's so it was so cool. Yeah, so cool. it is. It really is. That's a that's a good sweet spot to be at in resolution. That's my very very highest resolution spectra that I've ever taken. Were right about there. I could focus using the um, A band, the little doublets. Um, right. Just you know when they just barely started to come into view, I know I was at perfect focus. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay, well, um, we're coming up close on the two hour mark. So I wanna find out, were there any other questions that haven't been answered so far? Did we answer your question, Dave, on calibration? Oh, oh yes, yes. Okay. Did. So thank you. Um, you can use our spec for um, finding those lines too. It has a, some features about mm -hmm. pulling up which lines are in what um, relevant spectra, if you want to look there. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I've caught the telluric lines uh, with my camera. So, right, you, so that you can pin it there, and then you can the Balmer lines of hydrogen are just stand out like a sore thumb in mm -hmm. even five angstrom resolution or fifteen angstrom resolution um spectra you can go get all of those good a star and uh and you've got them all mm -hmm. most of what i've been doing lately is uh, practicing focusing and exposure using the r spec tools and uh, uh it's been working out pretty well i'm, I'm happy with what i'm getting nice to be honest i've never um used the focusing or exposure aids and um r spec my camera doesn't appear to be compatible um, driver wise so oh um, they really helped me they, they came in real handy that's great yeah that 183 camera is a problem with our spec actually i think it's a problem with several different pieces of software yeah it's a great camera but uh it has never worked with my r spec stuff so yeah i actually no, asked 
I, I use Maxim and, and through an ASCOM driver, it works in Maxim just fine. My 294 does. Nice. Um, if anybody's interested in the 294, and I thought somebody else I heard had a 294, um, don't, don't, don't take biases with a 294. It has a problem with, with how it does readout for um, exposures less than a second. Mm -hmm. So don't take darks below a second. Don't take biases below a second. Don't take biases at all mm -hmm. with the 294. I don't know if that same problem is in the 183 or not, but in general, I don't use biases anyway. I take darks at the same exposure that I take mm -hmm. exposures at or lights at. So, yeah. That brings up one other question, Lauren. You have a 183. Um, when I reduce exposure to one second, there's a big jump in the uh, uh, dynamic range or something. Have you experienced that? That, that that's, it sounds like the exact same thing that's happening yeah. in the 294. Yeah. So one second, uh, everything changes drastically. That's that that is the 294 issue. It sounds like the 183 yeah. may have the same issue. Mm -hmm. So, so, so again, stay above. Yeah, stay yeah, above so, one second. Right, so, right. No biases for you either. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think it's a common issue with uh, ZWO cameras because okay. they don't have different modes for exposure. Right. for short exposure and longest exposure. Yeah. So they are just the modes using the exposure time and also the gain sometimes. Right. So you need to really take care and test care. Right, That's, right. exactly. So, so, so darks have got to be at the same gain and, and same exposure as your, as your lights. That's my, yeah. my two cents. Yeah, so. it's preferable. I was thinking about buying a 294 also, but I think it's too complicated to use. No, you know, it's I... not. It's not. It's a good camera. No, you can take bias. <laughs> no, no bias. No bias. Yeah. No. But I do uh, uh, exoplanet observing <laughs> with photometry. Okay. I cannot. Cannot. I need to take bias. Okay. So, so so don't get a two ninety four because if you yeah if, exactly it's exactly because if you need a bias frame two ninety four will not give it to you not an accurate one. Mm. Yeah, you need to take care of the, the, the exposure times. You not uh, you don't need to uh, change it from night to night because the, you you will lose all reference yep. from night to night if you change because it changes all the modes that it's using to configure the camera. So it's really tricky. I think QHI cameras don't have this type of issue because you can select the, the mode. Okay. But the ZWO, it's really an issue. So I like the 294 for the unbend one by one when I put it at, at um, F2 on my 11 inch. When I, I've got a Hyperstar that I put up front for taking mm -hmm. images and not spectroscopy. And it's, mm -hmm. and it's beautiful at 2. Point, what is it? 2.8? No, 2.3. Uh, micron pixels it's it's a tremendous camera so but again nice. not for what you want to do so mm. well it's very interesting to hear about this issue honestly i did not know about it before it sounds like it's something i need to check with my 183 next time yes. i take spectra so so yeah so so look at your noise from zero to two seconds and mm -hmm. watch the jump at one Jump or drop, depending on. Interesting. I I never noticed. I rarely use exposures over a second um, because it it doesn't give me any benefit with drift. The star will have moved too much in one second. Um, but I sometimes do if I'm shooting, you know, far enough north where the drift is not so fast. Then I'll go to one point two seconds or something like that. So I I really I think you're like I think you're okay if your darks are the same length as your exposures. Mm -hmm. but but look at what it does in bias yeah. so because you're, you're it because bias if you look at bias what your your camera will give you for bias at zero seconds to what noise you get at 1.2 or 1.4 seconds you will see that you can't use the bias to estimate what the the dark will be at at 1.4 seconds mm -hmm. 
hmm. or to to do the yeah. to do the conversion if you are going to do some if your darks are not exactly the same length as your lights so lauren if you uh set up your camera on a medium star medium bias and um set your exposure uh maybe two two seconds something like that turn on the histogram and just slowly lower the exposure and when you get down to one second there's a huge jump in the histogram yeah and like it goes it jumps from like 1.002 seconds to like 0.985 seconds and when that happens the histogram cuts I mean, the, the uh, distribution is cut in half it's huh. pretty strange yeah very very interesting i'll have to look at that um it's so it sounds like the issue is only if you're using um bias and darks um or darks that aren't matched exactly to your exposure time right, right? yes if you need to use a bias in a ZWO camera, from what I'm hearing, I, I know it, it's a problem in 294. If you have to use a bias, you're in trouble on a on a 294. Mm -hmm. So don't do it. Okay, good to know. So probably then um, that that doesn't mean that every spectrum I've ever taken has been invalid since I'm not actually using darks in the first place since I did there so heavily. I'm also not using bias. Then you're, but it does then, sound like something important to know because I advise a lot of people who are doing that. Right. Um, so 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 if you were let's let's say you were taking a bright star exposure at well no if you subtract out darks appropriately for each one you're you're okay. Um because the if you again if you match the dark to your exposure this problem doesn't show up. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Well, thank you. Okay, um, we've been talking for about two hours now, so I should probably be the responsible meeting host and, and bring things to a close. Um, this was very informative and very enjoyable, and I want to thank each of you for joining us today. And I hope that you will uh, show up at some of the later AV Spec open house events. And those are going to be um, with the exact same meeting info that you had emailed to you. So um, you can just reuse that. And um, we'll be meeting from now on every first Monday of the month at 1 p.m. ET. So just like this meeting that we just had. And then also every third Thursday of the month at 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, if that time works better for you, um, you're welcome to come. Or if you can make both, you're welcome to come to both. Um, is, that to, is, is that to pick up people in someplace else in time zone? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, to pick up people who um, maybe have uh, work or family obligations during the day in the US and or live in a different time zone. All right, Lauren, thank you very much. I've enjoyed this. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, y'all. See you next time. Talk to you later, Bye. Lauren. Bye. Bye-bye.